Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Heather Dahl, CEO of Indicio Tech. For those of you who have just joined us, we're going to be talking about starting simple to steal decentralized identity. You know, when beginning the journey of decentralized identity deployment using Hyperledger, Indy, Aries, and Ursa, the simpler you start, the easier it is, and it's more likely to make you successful. So that's why we're going to talk about um, with the panel that we have today, which includes Liquid Avatar Technologies and Indicio Tech. You can join our conversation too by posting to the Q&A section that's on the right-hand side of your screen. But first, let's start off with introductions. We'll have our two panelists introduce themselves. RJ, do you want to take the lead? Hello, everyone. My name is RJ Reeser. I'm the Chief Business Development Officer at Liquid Avatar which means I have the best job at the company. I get to take cool technology that comes out of these foundations that we're talking about today and apply them to real life solutions and um, get neat, get to meet really neat, interesting people um, that address everyday type problems that we all face around digital identity and, and your online identity. And Ken? Hi, I'm Ken Ebert. I'm the CTO at Indicio Tech. Uh, we're um, a company that focuses on the growth and the adoption of decentralized identity. We work with our partners to help them from training, architecture, consulting, uh, whatever it takes to get their product through uh, successful deployment and into uh, real life production. So I'm going to begin with you, RJ. Tell us about, about the very beginning when you started down the road of decentralized identity, thinking about projects within Hyperledger like Indy, Aries, and Ursa. What was the problem that you at Liquid Avatar were trying to solve? Yeah, so, you know, it was, we've been in identity and identity solutions set for the last three years. And what we found is that it's it's a one and done. And you have these islands of your, your connections with different companies and they own your data. And we thought there was a better way to do it where, you know, how do we create a, a, a system, a tool where the user, the consumer is in control of their identity and we empower them to use and share what they want, when they want and with whom they want. And, uh, you, you know, it, it seems, you know, that's kind of simple, but then you add another layer on it and say, hey, there, there can't be a central authority. It needs to meet all the growing regulations of all the different government entities that are out there. It needs to be interoperable. It needs to be inclusive. And most importantly, it needs to be secure. And so uh, we had that framing of, okay, how do we go to the next gen for identity? And uh, we had a great opportunity to, to meet with Indicio and, and move forward. So Ken, pick up there and talk about these first conversations that you had with RJ when Liquid Avatar, you know, called up and explained these problems that RJ was working on. What approach did you take in framing possible solutions for the Liquid Avatar team? So the, the first thing we have to do is take all of the, the big ideas. If you don't have a big vision, you're not going to go anywhere. But that big vision can sometimes inhibit the uh, actual implementation. So our first challenge was to try to take uh, RJ's um, enormous vision of, of, of uh, how to use decentralized identity to solve real world problems and pick one problem and then classify the parts of the of that were necessary to get that minimum ecosystem put together so that they had an issuer defined who is going to hold the credentials and how they were going to be held and who's going to be the first verifier it's uh, not that they are um, that the, the scope of the project won't go beyond that but if you don't pick a, a, a basic place to start where you control most of the variables and don't have to wait for anybody external to come along and, and uh, exist for you to be successful. So that scaling that the big picture down to what is going to be our first step. That was the first challenge. And RJ, how did you work on uh, defining what the first step was going to be? Yeah, so it, it's actually getting like minded individuals. So, you know, having a partner that understands that you know, we need a new system on enabling people to share uh, PII, personally identifiable information. So um, that whole first step for us was, 
you know, finding the right partner that wanted to develop the system. And, and uh, we, we introduced everybody and brought everyone together. And, and this trust triangle, um, we believe, is, is the direction that uh, everyone needs to go. Now, I've shared this trust triangle that's very familiar to those in decentralized identity, maybe new for those who are joining us to learn about decentralized identity. This probably is a blast from the past because this is actually the image that you and Ken first talked over um, in those first conversations. So maybe because, you know, the goal of this session is really we're committed to education and sharing our lessons learned with everyone. Take us through the conversations that you had in those early days on this limit, how it helped you. Yeah, so um, it was all about starting small and then being in a position to scale, right? So um, it can be very daunting. You can go in into a scenario where you know you have uh, paralysis through analysis to try to cover every single possible solution. And what we want to do is let, let, let's start with a, a good pain point it's around PCR tests and smart start with a, a small community where they, they, it was just granting access into certain facilities. And uh, there's existing governance that we have today. So let's leverage existing governance and structures and keep it, um, you know, a closed loop type solution. Um, and and roll out the technology it, you know one of the things that was very clear in earlier discussions is that we can't come up with every possible scenario or challenge the project's going to run into so let's get started and and start moving down the path um and then adapt and change as we go i think one of the key things that we talked about was some of the needs that uh RJ identified for the, the basic holders, the, the people who are going to hold these credentials, and looking at um, possible methods to incorporate open source solutions that already existed to meet those needs. And we looked at a mobile wallet and decided that a mobile wallet was probably not going to meet the needs, but that a, a custodial type of wallet where uh, a cloud agent could be uh, hosted on behalf of each user and then use a mobile agent um, a mobile application with a, a mini agent in it to, to control that. And so we looked at, at that as offering the most flexibility so that if they had more than one device or they wanted to access their agent through a web interface, that gave the most flexibility. So we, we took each of the components, we looked at the, the issuer and how would that issuance occur? What what are our initial schemas going to look like? Uh, I think RJ came up with five schemas right out of the two that were, were interesting and we tried to pick which is the highest value schema that we can focus on first. That issuer um, um, schema got defined, and then how is the relationship with the holder going to be established? Is it some, based off a pre-existing relationship, or is it going to be a new establishing a new relationship? And how do we cover both of those use cases? Once the, <laughs> the holder had, had the, a credential in hand or in, in their wallet, in their agent in, in the cloud and controlled by their mobile device, then who are they going to present it to? And, and once we had a, a, a closed loop system defined, we were able to start putting into, into place what are the steps that might be required to implement that. And that roadmap, um, we haven't stuck to the original roadmap. It, it changed as implementation went along, but it gave us a good basis for um, setting out for our first um, our first use case and there are, how many use cases have you come up with since the first use case rj it's uh it, quite a few right and uh it, it's a difficult to choose which ones to do next but it's um uh, it's scaling rather rapidly so there's there's lots of different use cases we're probably well over 10 different types of credentials so um it's very exciting i, I wanted to add add you know one other item to that is that um you know one of the most important pieces was that there's no one central authority right one point of failure and creating that that mobile agent right where it's not tied to a device it's agnostic right so if you lose your device you can use your biometrics to get back to your credentials um through other methods and that was one of the key features that we were able to build out by using this technology stack. Yeah, that, that was a, a key part of it is that 
um, the account recovery problem became a much simpler um, challenge to tackle because we were able to say the, the, the more reliable cl the cloud hosting would take care of that. If the consumer drops his uh, phone overboard and, and uh, it goes to the bottom of the lake, it doesn't, it's not as a critical uh, catastrophe for them. They get a new phone and they can reestablish that connection and their identity, their, all the credentials that they've had, the relationships that they've set up are still existing. And so that solved one of the particular challenges that you were concerned about. For sure. So for those of you who have just joined our conversation, we're talking about starting simple to scale decentralized identity with RJ Racer of Liquid Avatar Technologies and indeed CS Ken Ebert. You can also join us by posting to the chat or Q&A feature that's located on the right-hand side of this window here today. Um, I think, RJ, it's important to point out, or at least take a minute or two to focus on, is one of the things that we're trying to do with Liquid Avatar is build upon an existing system, an existing company. You didn't come to this from scratch, right? You were not building from the absolute ground up. You had an existing solution that you were trying to um, transition and leverage verifiable credentials with this. Can you talk to us a bit about how the decentralized identity model was actually helpful? Yeah, so um, the system was we would go through a, a, a KYC process where people would use a government issued identity or credential and create uh, or verify their identity. And it would be a one and done for an individual company. And we were like, how can we change that instead of having the company be in control? And for me, I'd have to do it at four, five, six different companies and share that information at each one. How can we change that and allow me to go through and create a credential that proves who I am and then only share the pieces of that credential with each of those at different individual companies? Um, one story that everyone here always uses, you know, in our different networks is all about, you know, trying to prove your age today. When you prove your age, you're giving them all this personally identifiable information that they can use to, to uh, actually cause harm. So all they really need to know is that I'm over a certain age. So if there's an age issue with a credential, we don't have to share the birthday. <clears throat> we can just share that I'm over a certain age and so on and so forth. So. I saw that, that these standards, right, using, um, you know, Aries and, and Hyperledger was really the only um, tool for us that made sense on how to, how to move forward and, and build out that platform where the power shifts from the companies to the individuals. And it's in line with all the regulations that are out there right now today as well. The, the liability also shifted from the companies back to the individuals, which is a benefit to the company as well, so they can avoid some of that liability. That that selective disclosure and predicate proofs that you were talking about are are great tools for privacy pre, uh, preservation for the end users, but they're also good tools for helping limit the liability and exposure that the companies have to data that can be toxic to them. They need they need to see some data. They need some uh, something to rely on, but. If you uh, can limit the data that's being shared through the zero knowledge type methods and and uh, selective disclosure predicate proofs and so forth, then you have uh, the ability for the companies to get this, the, the bits and pieces that they need to make good business decisions and to rely on the data without exposing them to all of the PII that subjects them to uh, lots of different regulations. It, I always, you know, when I sit here and I meet with different companies, it, it's you kind of see a relief on their face that there's actually tools that allow them to be compliant now. I mean, it's such a challenge with a lot of these regulations. How do you do it? Um, and, you know, every industry is a little bit different, has different requirements. But for what I've seen for the lion's share of them, they now have the tools, right, that they can actually feel comfortable that they're compliant with all these different regulations. So, and we have a question here from Patrick, um, based on what you're talking about. He asks, do you see self-sovereign networks without a central authority um, that adds new peer networks working in the future? If I understand you correctly, you are currently deciding who is a trusted issuer and how is that decided? There's, there's a couple of aspects to issuers that are interesting in the system. One is, 
how does somebody become capable of becoming an issuer? And one of the things that I think that RJ and Liquid Avatar were looking for was what is a mechanism to allow uh, companies to adopt the technology without having to be completely um, embroiled in all the details all the way down. And, and one of that was one of the, the 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 challenges of how do we make it easy for issuers to to get onboarded and, and be able to quickly be able to issue a credential. So that's that's one aspect of of the issuance process. Do you, do you want to talk any more about the issuance on that side before we talk about verification and trusting? Yeah. So. Um there's a lot to it, and I'll try to unpack it a little bit. So, um, you know, there's the first piece is, is is how do we do it today, right? And um, when I go to prove my age, we already have a system, a governance system out there. They will accept a driver's license from the province or the state that I'm from. But if it starts to be, you know, a driver's license from, you know, Ken's driver's license shop, you know, you're not going to accept that credential. So how do you create that framework or governance around to say these are the proper companies that can issue or organization institutions that can issue in the ecosystem? So it goes back to let's not try to create a governance package that that covers every possible scenario out there. Let's start with a closed loop scenario like the one we're rolling out with. There's existing regulations for PCR tests and who can do a PCR test. Um, and document those regulations, apply them to our little ecosystem and allow on our platform for them to issue those credentials. And then it's interoperable, right? So now you can have anyone that's following the same um, uh, technology stack, if you will, and tools can apply and join the ecosystem and, and move forward. So, so I think there's two, two critical parts to it is enabling people to become issuers whether you trust them or not is, is irrelevant at that point. It's can they issue and get a credential out there? On the on the flip side, like RJ talked about, you now have to establish rules, but the rules can be per verifier or per verifier type of organization or vertical. And they can determine their own rules and say, uh, yes, there are a driver's license issued by the, the province of Ontario. There's one issued by the state of New York. And I accept both of those. Uh, I don't accept Ken's instant driver's license uh, <laughs> issuance process, although uh, some people might find that to be amusing and, and, and allow that type of credential as well. But but the, the point is to allow um, broad issuance and then um, jurisdictional or vertical or an organization to, term, to determine its own rules. And they might go on some guidelines. The, the, the federal government might issue guidelines to say, these are, the, these are the people we know to be trusted issuers, and I'm going to use that list when I do a verification uh, and rely on somebody else's due diligence that I trust to help establish guidelines for who might be a trusted issuer. Or I might make up my own rules that say, um, you know, you haven't, as a federal government, you haven't considered that I like uh, foreign driver's licenses that were issued in the EU. And so I'm going to also accept those in addition to the ones that are are listed on your um, recommended guidelines. But that, that's a decision that can be made by individual verifiers. They can publish their own uh, uh, trusted uh, list of people that they rely on, or they can um, rely on other people's. But it, it gives a flexibility to the system that, that allows it to grow and allow for these ad hoc type of relationships to occur without having to predetermine it all ahead of time and publish it in a grand scheme that was uh, once and done. So I read his question again, so I'm gonna be really direct. So yes, self-sovereign identity, hands down, absolutely. Um, and then the second part of your question is, you know, right now we're deciding who can be trusted, but that can be expanded and the scope could be increased as it grows. Our main intent here with this first ecosystem is let's work through and find some of the challenges that you can't come up with, you know, sitting in a, in a meeting in the boardroom saying, this is how we're gonna roll it out. Um, and we've got quite a few participants in it and we're rolling out and we'll keep making tweaks. And then the intent is then we scale it with these communities um, across the board. Uh, and one that I'd add, you know, is, is um, trust over IP, right? So they're using this whole stack and put it, putting together protocols, governance packages, white papers, 
um, that will allow this type of an ec ecosystem to grow. Because the reality is these open source technologies yeah, um, allowing everyone to play, in my opinion, is the only way this is going to be adopted globally and be able to scale and, and get mass adoption. So one of the things that you and Ken have both talked about is this concept of a closed loop ecosystem. And I'm going to share this slide because some of us are visual learners. And um, I think this helps explain what you're talking about. Maybe Ken, you can dissect this image and then um, RJ talk about what it means to you at Liquid Avatar. This this is uh, uh, diagram is more busy than it probably needs to be, but at the bottom you have some kind of a, a network that helps provide the validation of the, the public keys and the trust that it's built on. But um, on the left you have a uh, particular issuer who is going to issue a credential to the employees on the right. So it's an HR person. They have a UI that allows them to act interact with their agent. The, their agent may be looking at a uh, the HR server in the background to say, um, we'll look at our HR database to determine who the employees are. We already have a relationship with them with email or whatever. We can send out an invitation and allow the mobile agents uh, that the employees have on the right to connect with our uh, cloud company agent and receive a credential, an employment credential. Uh, once they have that credential, they can uh, use that with a benefits partner, for instance, who becomes the verifier. So you're representing all the bits and pieces of that trust triangle. You're looking at the, the issuer, the HR department on the left. You're looking at the holder agents on the right. And you're looking at a verifier, the benefits uh, partner with their agent. We have a mediator cloud agent in there too. That's basically to provide routing for those mobile agents that move around and don't have fixed endpoints. But you're, you're putting together the trust triangle and you're managing all three parties. That's the important part for getting started. You have all three parties identified. So RJ went through and identified an, an issuer for their first um, system. They identified how they were going to do their agents that represent the, the holders or employees or whoever it is. And they ver looked at the, who's going to be the verifier. So you've got a simple one. You don't have to stand up your own network. That's something, there's an Indicio network. There's a Sovereign network. There's the Findi network. There are networks that you can rely on that are already stood up that allow you to, to, to put your uh, schemas and your uh, did documents out there so that the whole thing works. But you're looking at what is the simplest ecosystem? Are there other partners that could come in later? I think RJ can think of, of more, more places to use those credentials beyond the initial one. But in the beginning, you want to keep it this in, uh, in a kind of a closed loop system so that you can get the whole thing working. And once you have it working, then the expansion glory goes on and lots of different use cases will pop up. RJ, what does this uh, image mean to you with your work at Liquid Avatar? Yeah, just the flexibility, right? And, and that's the key. So for me, it's the flexibility with, with the individual, the consumer, the employees. How do you put the power in their hands? Um, and then just increase it to your everyday everyday life scenarios. So for us, you know, this particular diagram is all around, you know, the companies that you work for and getting access. Um, and what's important here that, that I want to touch in on is uh, this systems, you know, with all these tools, we're able to, for the HR and the company, you can have like a PCR test. They don't want the PII or control or own the PII that's associated with that that PCR test that they're going to have or any kind of a medical type test. And with this system, it allows that the employees has full control and they share the pieces that need to be shared. They don't have to share everything or the whole record, um, which gives a lot of power across the board to all these participants. And, and I think that that's for me, the, the, the foundation of why I made the decisions we made, right? Because, so from day one, we've always wanted an environment where you can share what you want, when you want, with whom. And this is the technical diagram for that. So, so what, oh, go ahead, Ken. I was gonna say that there, there's stages to the whole thing too. Uh, you put together a quick prototype that shows how it can work. If you're happy with that, you go on to the next phase. If not, you can make some small tweaks before you've tried to, to roll the thing into an entire production scaled out um, uh, system. 
you try it out in, in prototype. Once you're happy with the prototype, you try it out with real users on a small scale so that you get an idea of, of are there any things that we overlooked or use it, um, ease of use things that might be involved that you can polish up before you go to production. Once you get into production, then you're starting to worry about things like, uh, how do I scale it? Scaling is an awesome problem to have. It means that you've been yeah. successful at getting it into production. Then look at how to scale things and make it more efficient, and how to make it cost less per user. Those questions come up at that point. But if you try to deploy at scale from the beginning with by skipping all the other steps, you miss out on the learning that can occur there and the cost savings that can result from taking a, a small course change early rather than trying to do, do it once you've got a full production system at scale. And one of the things, Ken, when you talk about this, this image that's maybe a little bit too busy or overcomplicated, let's face it, for some people going into decentralized identity, they're overwhelmed before they even get to, to the prototype because you've got tools, you've got platforms, communities, governance, standards. Um, I'm probably even missing parts of it. It's a very busy space. So how do you even start to make sense of all these pieces to allow yourself to even move forward with the prototype? I have, I have one thought on that, and that's to focus on the credential. And I think that's what RJ does a good job of, is saying, we're going to look at a uh, an identity credential and a validated email address or something very very simple like that but once you start to, to look at what the credentials are then you can say how can these be combined to, prov to provide a stronger assurance or what are other credentials that could be added to the system in a stepwise fashion or where else can these credentials be used and i think that's the key the key, um, the key question is where else can they be used? Because you think up one use case of how to use them. Uh, when driver's license were first issued as a, as a piece of cardboard or a laminated piece of plastic, um, they were intended to prove that you're able to drive. But other people came along and said, hey, I can use this. I trust this. I can use it to verify your address. I can use this to verify um, uh, your name. I can look at your photo and see that you know your name and your photo are associated. There's other use cases that pop up, and that's the same thing with the digital credentials, the verifiable credentials. And and once you have a system for allowing easy creation of credentials by trusted parties, um, or by anybody, and then you can figure out who which of those you're going to trust and where they might be useful and applicable. And I think that's part of the natural growth of a system. But by doing it stepwise, you can get something up and running and have that conversation and have a credential that you can actually go out and share that that makes it a lot easier to talk with a, a potential customer than if you have a uh, twinkle in your eye and and no working software i know rj that's uh, something we talked about in the early days is there's so many moving parts in this space so many pieces um, where do you begin and what what is your advice to someone that has just started looking into this trying to figure it out yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of divide the question up a, a little bit, right? And so, you know, the first piece is, is, is I think that a lot of the folks that are going to be, uh, you know, on our call and listening to this are going to be more technical and, and they want to know how they get into the space or how their business gets into the space. And, uh, you know, there are so many smart individuals that are here. I've always been impressed over the last two and a half years all the different working groups that I've joined and, and how wicked smart they all are. But there's one little, little item that everyone can get, and that is everyone produces all these white papers. Get a hold of these white papers. They have them front and center on their websites um, and, and re go through the web, the, those white papers and you start to get an idea. We all have dead, you know, dead time. I'll be sitting in between baseball games with my kids reading white papers and my wife looks at me like I'm crazy. And, and you just got to grind through the papers and try to figure this stuff out. I think that's core one. Um, and one, and then join some of these working groups, get on and just listen. And everybody's at the same spot you are. It's not like you got to add, get on there and, and, and lead the discussion right away. Just get in there and join these working groups and participate. So that's the one piece. The other piece is, and I, this is the one that I really, really wrestle with is how do we explain this to the individual users? How do I explain it to, you know, everybody that I come across, people I used to work with or my family members, what are you doing? And you try to explain to them what this digital credential is. 
and I don't have the 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 magic solution on that one. Um, I think it's going to be the same way we learned other apps and other technologies. Just put it in their hands, let them use it. Maybe a test environment, working on some cool stuff around there. You get to use it. You get to experience it. And once you see it and feel it and say, "Hey, here is a credential that looks just like my driver's license. It has ten fields." Hey, here's a place where I can do a QR scan, and then they ask me that they want these four fields. Guess what? I'm going to only let them see one field, or I'm going to let them see that I'm over 21 or over whatever age it is, and use it in a safe environment. And then all of a sudden, they're going to be just knocking our door down. Add this to everything else. Keep adding. Try it over here, over there, and then it'll just continue to grow. Um, and I think it's it's those pieces, and there's lots of companies out there that have access to different walls that you can get to. And we just need to get individuals in there using these credentials and really good use cases. And I think the one that we're working on right now around PCR tests uh, is going to be a really neat use case where people are going to want to embrace it and use it because it's you know the trust level is so high, and the and with the accuracy that um, and the security that. That I think it's going to be a no. I hope it's going to be a no brainer. Think- well, for, for those of you who have joined us, um, we're talking about starting simple to scale decentralized identity. We have RJ Reeser of Liquid Avatar Technologies and Ken Ebert of Indicio Tech. If you want to join our conversation, just add to the chat or the QA um, slide here on the right hand side of your window. Ken, I cut you off, so I'm going to jump back to you. I was going to say that uh, there are many credentials that have a physical counterpart right now, and some of them have um, problems associated with them. They have fraud. They have co- high cost to, to prevent fraud. You have to put little holograms and things and try to put a, a protective coatings on them and things like that. And so by moving to a digital verifiable credential, uh, this can help reduce cost and fraud in those uh, credentials. And so for many issuers, it can be a case of uh, taking an existing credential that they already have and transforming that into a verifiable credential. That gives them a a mechanism that reduces their overall cost and allows for people to to trust and verify those credentials um, more readily. There are some places where there aren't existing credentials where it would be a great idea to cook up a new one that might um, prove something and, and help establish things. And because the cost can be um, embedded in a, a verifiable credential issuance system that is um, cheaper to maintain than a printing press, um, you're able to get those credentials into the hands of, of holders and establish uh, relationships of trust and also be able to uh, let the, the end users benefit from the, the thing that you've done. You may put together an employee credential to allow them to safely come into their fa- into a factory so they can help build cars uh, during COVID. But you may find that that employee credential, when shared appropriately, might uh, work with partner organizations, services, and, and other partners that might um, have a relationship with your company that uh, your employees can benefit from, your, your benefits organization, your um, travel and vacation service that you offer them, a health screening, whatever whatever types of things. And those employee credentials can be used in ways that you hadn't anticipated when you first set out to open your factory for uh, safe uh, manufacturing. And I think, Ken, what you hit on with relationships is key for our conversation moving forward. We spent the first half of the hour really focused on the starting simple. And for those who are just beginning the journey to decentralized identity, now for our second half, let's focus on the scaling decentralized identity. And I think that's where these relationships really come into play. So RJ, you're at the point now where you've crossed over, you've already started, you've had success, and now scale is reality and what you're dealing with. Can you talk to us a bit about what it's like now to deal with the scaling part of it? Um, to deal with which part? I'm sorry, you broke up just for a second. Oh yeah. Um, we're talking about scaling decentralized identity. Scaling. Now that we've built and we've started, and we've started simple, how do you scale the simple closed loop ecosystem out, which is your reality right now? Yeah, so um, there is, there is. we're actually on the whiteboard doing that now. I, I think there's a, lots of really good options. So what I believe it is is, is now connecting the two different 
all the different multiple ecosystems that are out there, all the different um, credentials that are out there, all of them have lots of strengths uh, that they can provide. And then it's just finding the ones that, that are the, the ideal fit. Um, so we have, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what all I can talk about, unfortunately, but what's neat is there's, there's some natural fits and progressions that I never even knew existed uh, that are now coming to, to fruition on uh, taking it to the next step and to the next level. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge in the fact that you, you don't want to boil the ocean. You don't want to try to be everything for everyone. You, you got to make sure you keep laser focused and choose the correct projects um, that you can get quick wins on, right? And, and you can get deliver results uh, that you can leverage to go to the to the next phase, right? And um, what we're all what we're all focused in right now is, I think, is really important is what's the first government entity, division, institution that that that's going to embrace this, right? There's a couple of them, but but at some point there's going to be that tipping point, and you know, again, these are just my opinions here. I, I think everybody wants to move forward. All these institutions want to move forward, but they don't want to be number one and they don't want to be the last one, right? So they, they want to be like third or fourth so that people can work out the bugs and then they come in because they don't want the egg on their face if it doesn't work or, or whatever the problems are. And they don't want to be last because they if they're last, that's the issue in itself. So everybody's at that starting line ready to go and they want some of these use cases that we have and some of these successes. Um, and so it, it's it's really exciting point right now. Um, there's huge momentum in, in that direction. So it, more to come, right? I think that's a really funny image. It's a race where nobody wants to be first and nobody wants to be last, and they're all waiting for somebody to take the first step. But that's one of the reasons why um, taking that first step and putting out a very small scale project it, it breaks the ice and that, yeah. that gets people. Uh, excited, they can see that it does work, and they're more willing to take their their own first step once that the, somebody else has already taken the first step. And, and I think that's really cool. When you look at scaling, there's a number of, of ways to talk about scaling, and you've talked about one of them, and that's kind of like the partners. Um, but there's there's scaling of individuals, so you might be successful in a trial in a small subset of your organization. You took the HR department and put them in, and then you can scale it out to the other employees. Uh, so that you have a small group that you work with at first and scale the number of people. That's the holders being scaled. You could also scale it to other people's holders. So it's not just your factory, it's it's more people that are involved. You can also look at issuers, and that typically talks about credentials that are being scaled. So the different, you can take the same credential that you use um, in, your, in your first system and take it to another issuer and say, would you like to issue too? Um, that's one way. You can come up with new types of credentials that might be issued. You started off with a simple email verification credential or an employee verification credential. Now you can expand that to say, we're going to combine that with a uh, another type of credential. We're going to do a background check uh, credential. It's going to be issued by the uh, federal government who investigated you and proved that you uh, have a security clearance. So you can take the number of types of credentials that are being issued and scale those up too and have them interact with your system that already has a number of, of credentials existing. You can also scale the, the verifiers, the people yes. who are working on that. And the, the, all three of those, are in, or all four of those are interesting things. Number of issuers, number of credentials, number of holders, and number of verifiers. And, and each of those, like RJ mentioned, can be done on a single relationship. You're not trying to do it all at once. You're saying, hey, we've got this system. Here's a, another way, another high value place where we think there's going to be a good interaction and a good fit for another another partner to come in. And now instead of an issuer, a verifier, and one set of holders, you've now brought in another partner, and then another, and then another. And as you do that, uh, it creates a tornado effect, and um, there's um, the value grows beyond what you envisioned in the first place uh, to, to uh, create the, what I would call an open system. It's not closed loop anymore. It's an open system where many people can come and they can bring their own governance rules of what they trust and don't trust. They can bring new types of credentials that they're going to issue. And then the people who are already participating can say, hey, that is an interesting credential. I would like to, to rely on that as well. But it, it gives that, that growth can happen on, on those four different dimensions at least. 
there may be more that I haven't thought of, but um, it's a it's a great place to start and it's a good story to tell. Ken, Mark wrote us here, he writes, uh, seems like the scale problem for decentralized identity is the same problem as for many other areas of blockchain, interoperability. Are you involved in interop work broadly or focused only on DID? Um, you have to start somewhere. Um, so the, the first area that we've chosen to focus on is interoperability within the ARIES community. And uh, uh, one of the first things we looked at is how do we scale beyond a single indie network? That seemed like a, a pretty basic question, but it wasn't answered at the time we embarked on it. It's one of the reasons we stood up the Indicio network is to begin testing of uh, cross network, um, cross indie network um, did resolution. There are other types of credentials that are out there and there are different did systems as well that that uh, different signature types and so forth and most of that work is happening i think uh, one of the places of, of uh, effort is in the indie community in the aries community on focusing on how can we bring in uh, new types of resolvers how can we bring in um, different uh, ledger types different signature types and and those types of things how do we increase our interoperability testing capability so that we can prove reliability that um, the interoperability is occurring? There's other types of interoperability with, with uh, for instance, paper credentials of, of vaccinations. How do you bring those into an ecosystem and, and bring them into the out of the stone age and into, um, or the paper age and into the digital age and uh, provide a way to reliably uh, convert a, less trustworthy credential into something that can be more trustworthy. So there's a number of areas where interoperability um, is uh, important. There's interoperability with legacy systems as well. So RJ has uh, already experienced some of this is how do you tie a system into a, a, an existing system so that you can um, get data to put in a credential? Or once you've verified a credential, how does it interact with a system that already exists? And so there's integrations as well as uh, uh, as an aspect of how does how does the whole ecosystem play nicely with uh, others? RJ, your thoughts? Yeah, so it, it's a foundation for interoperability, right? Every every working group, Aries, Hyperledger, um, you know, Trust over IP. That is one of the core foundations for self sovereign identity. And I never realized how complicated of a word that is because we could have vertical interoperability, right? And that's that's the key. One of the strengths with this credential and self-sovereign identity is that I can't just move this credential everywhere. So that's the strength, is that it is locked to a bound identity to that agent. I just can't take that credential and put it in, on, on a different agent uh, and move it, different wallet, different agent. So that's a strength uh, that builds the trust, but you want it to be interoperable so that no one's tied into a single company or what have you. And so um, there will be a process that, that these working groups are working on so that you can change from one agent to another. Uh, it isn't fully defined. But today you have interoperability, vertical interoperability, all the way down to you know, the networks or the utilities is one term they use on the blockchain on which utility that you're using. So there's interoperability that exists today that allows um, choice with the consumers and i continue i'll see it, it it will grow it'll grow quickly to even be more diverse and dynamic uh on interoperability but you don't want to have interoperability at um um the downside or decreasing the security and the trust layer you we need to make sure that that digital trust is there and it's maintained um but it's still interoperable so RJ has been a strong proponent, I think, of, of interoperability at the wallet level as well. So interoperable wallets so that they're compatible with each other. That's that's one aspect of it. But the migration capability of, take, of wallet interchangeability is another aspect. And it's a different term, but the ability to migrate your credentials from one wallet to another. And that's a slightly different um, story. and and. Uh, an area that needs attention as well. So I think that there's a whole bunch of uh, interoperability terms and you can talk about it at the network level, the protocol level at diff at didcom, 
You can talk about it at Aries and what uh, types of credentials they s support. You can talk about it also at, uh, I think RJ has taken the lead on, on trying to think ahead on how wallets might be interoperable or manageable or back upable and restorable to a different wallet. Those are, those are topics that um, also are, are of prime concern in terms of interoperability. So we want to thank Mark for writing his question. For those who just joined us, and you might have a question for RJ or Ken, just use the Q&A or chat feature that's located on the right-hand side of your window. So one of the things that at these conferences and events, you'll hear a lot of presentations that are glossed over, and it's highly successful, and it appears to be so easy because the success went from problem solution to celebration, three slides. But here, we're all about keeping it real, because the only way we can advance the adoption of decentralized identity is by learning from each other. So I want to go to you, RJ, and talk about one of the challenges or obstacles that, one, you weren't expecting, and two, that you had to overcome in order to achieve a milestone. Um, that's a good question, right? It's it be, I don't know how to answer it, right? I, I think there was challenges across the board. So when you're starting something completely new like we are, there's a lots of, of education that has to go on. Um, and so that was kind of the first step is how do you meet with your partners and explain what a digital identity is and how you empower the consumer and how that is beneficial for all, all parties involved. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the other question for me was, where do you get the bench? Where do you get the people that are going to help you build it out? I mean, it's, it's, you just can't find engineers that, that um, have the skill set needed to roll these projects out. So um, the, the nice thing is, is finding the partners that can help us roll these things out. Those, are, those were the two biggest challenges. Um, and working with DCO and finding the right partners help, helped us with that so that everybody's on the same page. We're starting something that, that not a lot of organizations have done before, um, and it's cutting edge, which is exciting. I mean, that's, that's what I love about these projects. It's cutting edge. We can say we're one of the first ones to do, you know, a digital identity used in these type of scenarios. But with that is, you got to find the right people that are ready to roll up their sleeves and, and handle those challenges that are associated with being first out there or one of the first. There's lots of companies that are doing some great work. One, one of the fun problems is a technical problem was that the, uh, the mobile wallet um, interface was written in uh, React Native and uh, it needs to be integrated into an existing app that was written in Flutter. And so those are those are some of the kinds of problems that I think are fairly typical of trying to do that. But that type of integration is not uncommon. That's that's going to be a um, a, a challenge. It's, it's not an insurmountable challenge, but that kind of challenge will happen with uh, enterprise agents being integrated with backend systems. That'll happen with mobile wallets being integrated with existing applications. And you're going to find that. Another interesting challenge we ran into was uh, a couple of holes in some of the protocols. They were mostly there and did most of what needed to be done, but there was some gaps in, in, uh, in the protocols. And that's the kind of things that you discover when you do an implementation rather than a whiteboard discussion. And so that learning experience has helped fill in the gaps on both the conversion to Flutter and the uh, protocol um, missing components to make the protocol stronger and more interoperable and, and useful. So that learning experience uh, comes early on, and I think it positions RJ and his team in a position of advantage to be able to um, take what they've learned and build on top of that for the next round of uh, benefit that they're going to provide to their customers. So I will, it's uh, we have ten nine nine minutes left in our session here. Governance. I want to take a few minutes to talk about governance because what we hear from companies, organizations, is that early in the journey, governance does become a challenge, of almost a blocker, because as you described it, RJ, it's analysis paralysis. So how did you work through governance in the very early days, RJ? And what does governance mean now that you're starting to scale? Yeah, so um, 
for us, I mean, just to boil it down is the closed loop helps, right? So you don't have to, to uh, cover every single possible scenario. But the other one is just use the existing governance we have today, just like the credentials. Most of these credentials that are the first credentials out of the box are ones that we have paper versions. So we're just using the existing governance that we already have around, you know, the medical health industry um, and just leveraging those and meeting those because they have to meet those requirements anyways. It, just because it's a digital form, they still have to meet HIPAA and all the other regular requirements that, that they have. Um, so how does this platform help enable it? And, and we found that, you know, with these governance packages, you keep them simple and get them out it actually allows you to be more compliant because you're given the control to the individuals. I think that you made a couple of key points. One of them is model the existing governance that exists today. Second is keep it simple by bounding the problem. You don't try to solve all the problems. You solve the one particular problem that you're working on. Another step that we did was uh, introduce, uh, even though there's not a, a defined standard around it yet, we d proposed what could be a working standard for machine readable governance and we're implementing that uh, there will probably need to be adjustments to that as, as time goes forward and standardization occurs but innovating around that helped make it so that as changes were needed to uh, the governance they're uh, made in configuration files rather than having to rebuild uh, the entire applications one of the things rj you brought up is educating how do you start talking to folks about decentralized identity? And then as you, or you're at the point of scaling where you're trying to bring in new partners, once again, you're going through this exercise. What are some tips that you've learned along the way? And when you get up to that the next time, it makes the chance of getting fall out of the park much better. Yeah. Um, you know, just listen. Join, join all these working groups. Listen, listen. Um, and try to contribute and help as much as you can. And then don't be afraid to, to take that step and, and move forward, right? Um, that, I mean, that's the key one. It, it's, it's uh, you know, when I started with, with the company, we have a lot of forward thinking individuals at our organization. And it, and it was fun to kind of, to, to bring the idea of where we think digital identity is coming and have everybody in the organization embrace it. And so, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to take the first step and uh, and have fun with it. I think that by limiting the scope of what you tried to do in your first step, you limited your risk and you got the opportunity to learn from that and, and grow as well. So I think that, that keeping the scope narrow as at the beginning helped um, make it more feasible to take those first steps and to get into the market to figure out what, what are the needs, the true needs, and adapt to that as you, as you learn from your initial findings. And one of the projects that I know RJ Liquid Avatar announced that they're um, part of the steering committee of Cardia, which is a new Linux Foundation public health project. Um, talk to us about, about Cardia and your role in that and how others can participate and help support the scaling of Cardia. Yeah, so now, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I boil it down to being turnkey, right? We've already figured out the path on how to move forward with this. So how do we bundle that together to help enable other ecosystems, other partners to move quickly down and learn from our lessons learned? So um, it, it is, again, it goes back to, and sometimes it, it doesn't seem, you know, when, you, when you're building organizations, it's not as clear, but, you know, how do you create um, a new industry, a new standard that's embraced uh, across the board with all different organizations. And it's not based on a closed system, right? It's not based on, it's open standards and having everybody contribute. And, you know, Cordia is that, is that foundation for it. We've created this path and we're bundling it up and we'll show this roadmap to others that, that want to move forward. Um, and we're excited about it. We're, we were, happy to join as one of the founding members and uh, we're going to leverage everything that we're learning to put into the system so that, that others that want to move forward and, and create these types of platforms um, have a roadmap that they can follow. So Ken, maybe you can explain a bit about more about Cardia from a technical point of view 
and how that might be a place for organizations to start a closed loop ecosystem and then scale it. So Cardia is basically uh, based on open source technology. It builds on top of Aries agents, Aries Akapai, Aries um, framework JavaScript and the Bifold projects, and then provides the unique characteristics of needed by public health and travel in particular to um, safely exchange um, health status type credentials. The, the cool thing about the Cardia project is that it's not just a, a specification, it's an implementation. It's, a, it's a, at least a reference implementation and a deployable reference implementation at that. That allows for people to take that uh, open source code, customize it, modify it for their particular use case, and then deploy that to take advantage of, of, the, of the work that's already gone on and the learning that's gone on. One of the things I like about having RJ on the a liquid avatar on the steering committee of Cardia is that they are um, willing to put out a proposal and then guide it to adapt it to uh, real world conditions and learn from what's happened to make it stronger and more broadly uh, useful. And so it's not a, a hypothetical, it's a practical take a few steps, adjust, take a few steps and adjust. And that mechanism, the steering committee is ideal for helping guide uh, what has been learned and uh, where we might go next in, in terms of setting out a roadmap for enhancements and improvements. The, the Cardia as it exists today is fairly basic, um, but it provides most of the functionality that's needed for a successful deployment. And for those organizations who want to work more closely with RJ and Ken, Cardia, you can find more information at C-A-R-D-E-A dot A-P-P, -P, that's Cardia dot app. And the meetings are every Thursday at noon Eastern time. We have one last question. We have two minutes, RJ. So let's see. It's um, question is, what are possible ways to monetize digital identity solutions, which in your business development role is a great question for you, or is this even planned? Um, yeah, so still to be defined, right? So there's... Um, there's a couple different ways or ideas on how it's going to be uh, monetized, but it's not clearly clearly um, defined yet. One of them is on the issuer side. So um, lots of companies are, are looking for issuers of credentials to, to um, subsidize everything that needs to happen in order for um, this to be profitable and be able to be scalable. Uh, there's other entities that are looking at the verifiers. So, if you can, if if you can have a higher level of trust, um, things can be more secure. What you know, what's the value to the verifier, and what are they willing to pay to do it? Um, I think there is somewhat of a consensus that this is not going to be a business model that charges the individual or the or the consumer. It's going to be the other pieces. Um, with you know, then. Then you kind of step further out and look at all of the other benefits to having a, a higher trust layer um, on the internet slash your digital identity. You know, what does it do to fraud and what, how much money is saved on fraud? So therefore, what fees can be reduced and or shared with other players in the ecosystem? Um, you can look at password reset, right? So how much time and effort and cost is going into password reset that if you can have a biometrically secured agent that holds your digital credential and you use that for access to all our different tools and email and Zoom and, and everything else, um, how much money does that save a company that can then use in the ecosystem to help support the network? Uh, it's not clearly defined, just like every other industry that um, that's nascent and starting, but there's lots and lots of potential. I'm not sure which one's going to win. Um, and there's lots of people looking at it and trying to figure it out, but it's it's there's value there. Um, there's need there. There's a pain there with across the board with all the users. And I'm sure you know it, it will rise to the top and show itself at some point. You, you build a good app that everybody wants to use. Um, you build functionality that addresses the pain. Organizations, entities. Um, they'll find a way to help subsidize and support it. And so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. I want to thank RJ and Ken for joining us today. You can connect with both of them on LinkedIn. I want to thank David, who's been in the wings, making sure that the 
technically was successful. I want to thank all of you for joining us. And um, I'm Heather Dahl, and we wish you a very enjoyable rest of the Global Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, everyone.